Thank you. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for the invitation for a uh, chance to be here and speak. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit different than the focus up until now. In some ways, it's the mirror image of a lot of what we talked about. I'm going to talk about not how pirates use law, but how states use law against pirates. In other words, what do states do when they capture corsairs? Uh, as we've seen in the 21st century, for example, in the detainee litigation at the US detention camp of Guantanamo Bay, or in the International Criminal Tribunals for U from Yugoslavia and for Lebanon, it's really when people are in custody that law is worked out, often after the fact, of who is a war criminal, what does that mean, who is a terrorist, what does that mean. Similarly, it was in captivity the Ottomans had to answer questions about captives. Suddenly, legal abstractions became real when a person was in custody and the state had to decide what to do with this person. So what did the Ottomans do with captured pirates? I'm going to argue that it changed over the course of the 18th century, and it reveals some things about how the Ottomans fit into the international legal framework and how the Ottomans saw law. In the early 18th century, there was a fairly consistent Ottoman tradition about captured corsairs. People captured as pirates, as privateers, as corsairs of any sort were, as far as I can tell, almost never executed, uh, unlike what, as Josh has told us, the Venetians did. There was a very good reason for this. The Ottomans needed their labor. The Ottoman navy, as we've heard, ran on galleys. And captured corsairs were good laborers in the galleys. I can't prove this, but I would suspect they also might live a bit longer if they were used to being at sea than land lovers would when enslaved in the galleys. So tr consistently throughout the early 18th century, and I think probably earlier as well, the Ottomans enslaved captured corsairs to row on galleys belonging to the Ottoman fleet. Uh, this was true for foreign subjects. And for foreign subjects, there was no release. Over the, uh, over the years, the Ottomans signed capitulations, commercial treaties with a number of foreign powers, and generally the capitulations banned the enslavement of subjects of that power. There was an unwritten exception, though, which is that, for example, uh, Spanish subjects could not be enslaved after Spain received capitulations. Neither could English after the British received capitulations. But there was an unwritten exception. Those captured as corsairs were not released. And European diplomats in the early 18th century simply took this for granted. They recognized that if one of their subjects found his way into Ottoman captivity illegally, they could petition to have this person released, unless the person had been taken as a corsair, in which case it was futile even to ask. Similarly, the same thing happened to Ottoman subjects when they were captured as corsairs. Uh, this often meant Ottoman Christians. They were condemned, just like foreigners were, to the galleys to row. In fact, in the eyes of the Ottoman law, they had become foreigners. The Ottomans believed that those who fought against the state, for example, as corsairs, had lost their protection. They'd broken their pact of zimmet, or zimma, their pact that, of loyalty to the Ottoman state in exchange for protection under Islamic law. So in other words, domestic corsairs in Ottoman legal eyes became foreigners and were treated in exactly the same manner as foreigners. Essentially, they rode until they died or occasionally until they were too old and were released because they were no longer useful. There were several challenges to the system, though, from the late 18th century. First of all, at around about 1770 or so, the Ottoman fleet finally turned away from using galleys for, naval purpose, for military purposes. This drastically reduced the need for uh, unskilled slaves to row the galleys, the kind of slaves you might find as corsairs. Secondly, as I discuss at length in a book I'm writing right now, the Ottomans developed a prisoner of war system. For captured soldiers from the Russian Empire or the Austrian Empire, they were no longer enslaved. Captured enemy soldiers were kept in state custody, kind of off to the side, still keeping their uniforms even, awaiting return when the war ended. So there was now a regular system of non-enslavement for foreign regular enemy captives. Finally, the third challenge was the reign of Selim III who's well known as a reformer in Ottoman history. As recent literature is revealing, Selim had this kind of mania for ordering everything under his control, ordering, categorizing, often ruthlessly. And he applied this to captured corsairs as well. These challenges all came to a head with the 1787 to 1792 Russo-Ottoman War, in which the Russians sponsored corsairs in the Mediterranean. In the previous war, the Russian Baltic Sea Fleet had sailed around Europe into the Mediterranean and had attacked the Ottomans there. In this war, the Ru main Russian fleet couldn't get to the Mediterranean. So instead, the Russians sponsored corsairs. And when the Ottomans captured these people, they had to work out these legal questions. I'm going to discuss that through a few case studies uh, of what happened in this war. The first case study is from uh, 1790, when a combined Algerian-Tunisian fleet operating under Ottoman orders returned to Istanbul. They had been sent out to track down corsairs operating under the Russian flag. 
And they did. They brought in seven or eight ships and 800 uh, captured, uh, I'm sorry, 600 prisoners. The British ambassador observed this happening, and he expected that, in keeping with Ottoman tradition, these men would be enslaved in the galleys. Uh, but that isn't what happened, in fact. Uh, the, the ships came in, and they were personally inspected by Sultan Selim himself. And at some point in his inspection, he dashed off an order, uh, which you see here, in which he ordered the execution of those captives. Uh, my, my translation, a part of this. So all of the captives who were collected in the Algerian ships are to be killed in suitable places, in the Bosphorus and in Istanbul and in Galata and in other places. Let none remain. There were reportedly more than 40. All are to be killed. And they were. 24 prisoners were hanged from the Algerian ship's yard arms. Uh, others were executed at the Imperial Palace or in front of churches in Galata, in Uskidar, and in Topane. The location here is not accidental. Selim deliberately, clearly intended to intimidate uh, his own subjects, his Greek Christian subjects, into not committing any more acts of corsairing and helping the Russians. In fact, in another order, he threatened to hold Greek leaders in the Aegean and in Istanbul responsible for their co-religionist actions. He wrote, if piracy increased, quote, I would kill the patriarch too. Let him be told this, directly threatening the entire Greek establishment in uh, the Ottoman Empire. One Ottoman chronicler noted that such executions had not been seen for 40 years, and he rejoiced that the Sultan was cracking down on piracy. Uh, but Sultan, Selim's ruthlessness was quite clearly limited by another factor, and that is sovereignty. Out of those captives who had been brought in, some were registered as being Ottoman subjects in the Ottoman uh, rec record books. Others had claimed to be subjects of Venice or of Russia, and Selim deliberately explicitly ordered that these were not to be executed, and indeed they weren't. So people coming from the same ship who'd been engaged in the same behavior, who previously would have suffered the same fate of enslavement, were now treated in two very different ways. The Greek Ottoman subjects were executed, the foreigners were preserved. Why? Well, not because they had economic value as rowers. They really didn't anymore. It was their political value that there was a growing sense that subjecthood mattered and that sovereignty limited what the Ottomans could do to other people's subjects, but not what they could do to their own subjects. So affiliation with a foreign state became a vitally important uh, characteristic, as the example of Cosimo Barbarigo uh, illustrates. I'm a little uncertain about his exact name, since I'm transliterating from the Ottoman sources here, and his background is a bit fuzzy. But what we do know is that he was captured during this war uh, and accused of helping Russian-sponsored privateers. If he were considered an Ottoman subject, he would have been executed, as the other captives were. But in fact, he claimed to be a Venetian subject, and therefore he was allowed to live. He was in fact placed with the Russian prisoners of war, and the Russians registered him in their record books as being one of them. Uh, moreover, the Venetian embassy lobbied for him to be released, claiming they had a tradition of punishing their own pirates, and that he should be let go for that reason. In their petition, the Venetian diplomats mentioned that Barbarigo had lived on the Venetian island of Kithara for some years, and that he had previously secured uh, safe passage documents from both the Ottoman and the Venetian states in which he was described as Venetian. So, therefore, he was Venetian. What they carefully avoided saying is that he was born in Venetian territory. It may well be that he was a little bit more fuzzier than this, but it was convenient to assert a Venetian identity at this moment. Indeed, when the war ended in 1792, the Russian, I'm sorry, the Ottoman Imperial Council surveyed all the Russian prisoners of war, and they discovered that 58 of them, they believed, were actually Ottoman subjects who had asserted other identities in order to survive. Selim, when he found this out, was quite angry. He wrote back to his imperial council, look, when these infidels were taken as corsairs, I said, let them be executed. But it was too late now. They had registered affiliations with other states, and those states' sovereignty now protected them. Um, things were a bit fuzzier, though, when it came to the question of who was actually a corsair. The one avenue left for those who wanted to survive, aside from claiming foreign subjecthood, might be to claim innocence. And this is the case of Andreas and Dimitri, the hapless mariners who, one day in 1791, were commanding a ship hauling supplies for the Ottoman fleet. They'd been commissioned by an Ottoman officer who was in charge of building a warship. Uh, they encountered Ottoman patrol boats in the middle of the night, however. A fight broke out, and after Andreas and Dimitri took the worst of the fight, they surrendered, along with 23 of their men. The Ottoman patrol boat commanders accused them of being corsairs, and they sent them to Istanbul, along with the evidence of their corsairing, some weapons, a Russian flag, and a letter written in Greek, which the Ottoman patrol commanders said was a letter of patent, a commission for them to raid on Russia's behalf. 
But when they got to Istanbul, uh, Andreas and Dimitri fought this charge, and they had powerful backing from the, the officer who had commissioned them to haul supplies. He went to bat for, on their behalf and stood up for them. And Selim, a bit surprisingly, given his ruthlessness in other areas, Sultan Selim ordered an investigation. He secured depositions from every officer in the area about what they had seen that night, what they had heard, and he took a step that no one had before, surprisingly. He had the letter patent translated from the Greek. And it turned out it was not a letter of patent at all. In fact, it was a safe passage document from the Russian privateer commander telling Russian privateers not to attack Andreas and Dmitri. Selim then wrote on his, uh, in his rescript, this is not a Corsair's license, and he ordered them to be released. Probably, he said, they had simply mistaken each other, the Ottoman patrol boats and Andreas and Dmitri, in the middle of the night, and no one was to blame. He said, let them go. It's interesting to note that Andreas and Dmitri were carrying this safe passage conduct uh, pass from the Russians alongside the papers that indicated they had paid their poll tax, the jizya, to the Ottomans, their jizya evrak lara. So they kind of had all their bases covered. The Russian flag presumably was there for the same purpose, although that attracted no comment from Selim. So these guys, I think, got lucky, given Selim's extreme ruthlessness in other contexts, probably because of their close connections to this Ottoman official building the ship. Other Ottoman captives, though, who were corsairs, were simply killed. On the other hand, things got better after the war for foreign subjects who fought as corsairs. In the aftermath of the war, the Austrian ambassador submitted a petition for the release of two Austrians who were held in Ottoman captivity. The Austrians had just made peace with the Ottomans, and so the Ottomans went to release these men, thinking initially they were prisoners of war, whom they were obligated to release. Upon inquiry, though, the Ottoman Imperial Council discovered these men had been captured 20 years before, in the 1770s, as corsairs. So they were, the council reported to Sultan Selim saying uh, that the ambassador must have been unaware when he made the request these men were actually pirates, because, of course, pirates could not be released. But the ambassador responded, no, I am aware of this. But the treaty explicitly says all Austrians will be released. As I noted before, there was always an unwritten exception to the capitulations that pirates would not be released. But the Austrians were now pressing this issue, saying, where is it written? Where is this exception written down? And the Ottomans were forced to concede there was no such exception in writing. And the written word of the treaty trumped custom. Therefore, these men were released. Over the next 10 or 15 years, it became increasingly common for European states to request the release of their subjects who were captured even as corsairs. So the treatment of European corsairs got better and better, and they became essentially equivalent to regular prisoners of war. On the other hand, that of Ottoman subjects got worse and worse. Uh, this is in such the line of sovereignty that had been drawn. The Ottomans could do what they wanted to their own subjects, even though, it's important to note, the only reason it was legal to enslave these Ottoman Greeks in the first place is that they were considered to have renounced their Pact of Zimet. In other words, under Ottoman interpretations of Islamic law, they had become foreigners, but not real foreigners, not foreigners with the protections of another sovereignty. They kind of fell in the middle in a sort of black hole where they had very little legal protection. And they didn't even have the economic protection they once had. Uh, enslaving people on the galleys was certainly not a humane solution of what to do with corsairs, but at least it didn't entail immediate death, as the new Ottoman traditions did. All these things then had echoes 30 years later in the 1820s during the Greek War of Independence. Once again, Ottoman fleets went and fought uh, corsairs operating from the Peloponnesus. They returned with bodies hanging from their yard arms as they had 30 years before. As is well known, the Ottoman state authorized the enslavement of rebellious communities. And they did so with uh, fatwas uh, justifying these people had broken their pact of Zimmet. They were not Ottoman subjects in other words. They were rebellious, they had left the empire. But when challenged on this, the Ottomans asserted, again, their own sovereignty. Um, the Ottoman foreign minister in 1821, when the British ambassador challenged him on why the Ottomans were enslaving these people, responded, this is John Effendi, the de facto foreign minister, said, the Ottomans, as an independent government, quote, had a right to act as she pleased toward her own subject, except where treaties interfered. Again, we see that the literal word of treaties is vital here more than custom or anything else. Even Russia, he pointed out, had never attempted, quote, to impose upon Turkey the general principle that she was not entitled to make slaves of her own subjects whenever she chose to do so. In other words, John Effendi's argument was, this is domestic Ottoman space, this is our sovereignty, you cannot tell us what to do. And the Europeans, at least in the early 1820s, basically agreed. Uh, the British ambassador to Istanbul, Lord Strangford, wrote back to London in 1821 that, quote, we have no right to obtrude there, meaning our and other European ambassadors, 
opinions upon the government. I'm sorry, this is him speaking in the third person about him and other diplomats, it's a bit confusing. But he said that other diplomats have no right to obtrude their opinions upon the government to which they are accredited and with the internal concerns of which, I presume, we are not entitled to interfere. So the, 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 these lines of sovereignty were pretty durable. When the Europeans did intervene in uh, the Greek War of Independence, as we've heard earlier, through the 1827 Treaty of London imposed a blockade, which then indirectly led to the Battle of Navarino, the legal justification they used was, again, piracy. It was not the enslavement of Ottoman subjects. That was an internal matter. It was the piracy occurring. Whatever their humanitarian motivations may have been can be debated, but the legal ground on which they based the Treaty of London was uh, piracy threatens their own interests, they must intervene. It's actually very similar to the argument the US now uses in Syria, that there is something happening inside the state against the state's own desire, but it troubles other states, therefore intervention is justified. So these lines of sovereignty kind of came back. Uh, as David Redonio has pointed out, this question of sovereignty had, uh, that, that characterized European relations with the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century is very much a modern question as well, as we see, for example, in Syria, as oppressive governments claim that sovereignty gives them the sole jurisdiction over internal matters against, other, uh, against others. And what I hope to have shown here is that these lines were debated in the Ottoman Empire through corsairs and through the question of what to do with captured corsairs, creating this dichotomy between those inside and those outside, where once there had been a fairly pragmatic, if brutal, equivalency between those inside and those outside. Thank you.